This topic, as far as the U.S. government is concerned, is one of the most highly classified matters that the government deals with. I've interviewed dozens of people, read thousands of pages of books, watched a number of documentaries, and still get new information every week. What you'll be hearing in this presentation is a very compact version of what's taking me literally 27, 28 years to learn. 2016, things will start to get bad. Abrupt climate change, the rising ocean. Now what NASA is calling the 10th planet is not the 10th planet we're concerned about. It's the 10th planet that's referred to in the Bible, also called Wormwood. First thing I will ask you, I'll ask you this question. Would the federal government of the United States of America lie to you? <laughs> That's the response I expect. Laughter. Of course they would. And they have for decades. Because of what I do and what I do professionally, I interact with people involved with law enforcement, including the FBI. I was working on a project with an, a couple of FBI agents, and we're having lunch one day. We'd gotten to know each other a little bit, and I thought, well, I'll ask this guy the question. What happened with John Kennedy when he was shot? Now, the man I was asking, this, this was not just a run-of-the-mill FBI agent. He was a supervisory-level FBI agent within a few years of retirement. He's now retired. And I kind of put him in a box because if he told everything he knew, he was jeopardizing his career and his pension. But if he said, John, all oh, the Warren report was exactly accurate, then I would know that he was a nutcase, because nobody believes the Warren report. So here's, here was his answer. It was a very creative answer. This is from a senior, a supervisory level FBI agent uh, regarding the Kennedy assassination. His answer was two words, creative forensics. Now, that let me know that he knew what every person who's looked at it carefully knows is that the Kennedy assassination was not what we've been told it is. <clears throat> a couple of personal things when it comes to secrets and how military intelligence knows about things before they happen. First week of May, 1967. I'm 19 years old. I'm in a military intelligence school and I got assigned for a Sunday morning, what they call a dining room orderly. My assignment was to be in the, in the uh, officer's mess where they serve breakfast on Sunday morning, stand at parade rest, and whatever the colonels and the majors wanted, if they wanted coffee, I go get it. If they wanted toast, I go get it. I stand there at parade rest, eyes straight ahead, and just wait on the officers. One colonel is talking to another colonel. Now, this is military intelligence school, and these are field grade officers in military intelligence. First week of May, 1967. One colonel says to the other colonel, you know, those Golan Heights are going to break loose any day now. First week of May, 1967. What happened four weeks later? The Six-Day War. Yeah, they knew. They knew. Fast forward just a few months, September 1967. Now, I see some folks in here old enough to remember the Tet Offensive of 1968 in Vietnam, end of January 1968, which took place only two months after General Westmoreland gave his famous light at the end of the tunnel speech to a joint session of Congress, December 1967, where General Westmoreland told the joint session of Congress that Viet Cong were defeated on the battlefield, can no longer mount a credible offensive. I get to Vietnam in 1967 in, in September. By the end of September, I knew about the Tet Offensive at the end of January 1968, four months before it happened, five months before it happened. I knew about it, and I was getting ready for it. Everybody else found out the last week of January 1968. Uh, you better betcha the people in military intelligence, they know about things before they happen. 
I know about things before they happen, even now because I've maintained my contacts inside military intelligence. What you're going to learn today is known by the major world governments. I doubt the president of Zimbabwe knows what we're going to talk about, but the heads of England, Canada, United States, Russia, China, they all know, and they're making preparations. The Vatican knows, and I have some local uh, connections there that I know how, about the Vatican and what they're doing. The Fortune 100 companies, they're getting ready and being prepared. My first-hand awareness began in, in year 2000. Two different men, friends of mine, they were both researchers. They approached me and they said, John, there's this thing that's going to happen. We're not sure about the date, but it's going to happen. It's going, when it does, there's going to be abrupt climate change. There's going to be... 200 mile an hour winds. The threat of climate be massive change tidal winds. could define the said, contours yeah, sure, of this century break, more you know? dramatically than any other. But I, I knew these men well enough that I trusted what they told me, and I, and I went to a, a confidential source and I said, Check this out. I need to find out if this is true. And my confidential source, a friend of mine, he says, Oh, John, you're, you know, that's silly. That, that can't be real. But he trusted me and knew me well enough to check it out. He gets back with me a few weeks later, and he says, John, it's exactly what you said it is. It's coming, it's going to hit us, it's going to hit us hard. And there's going to be 200 mile an hour winds, and there's going to be massive tidal waves, and earthquakes, and all the rest of all the things that you said. That was in the summer of 2000. And what should give us hope? That this is a turning point. That this is the moment we finally determined we would save our planet. My research has continued. I've continued to develop my, my sources and put the whole thing together so I can make this presentation. <clears throat> I've got copies in the lobby that I'll make available for anybody that wants it. It's the Department of Defense study done by a private think tank about abrupt climate change. Now, the Department of Defense spent many thousands of dollars to have this private think tank put this paper together. And I've got a quote from the, this. And this, what I've got out here that you can get is the open source unclassified version. The classified version I haven't been able to get my, my hands on. But here's the first paragraph of that paper by Peter Schwartz and Doug Randall. Recent research, however, suggests that there is a possibility that this gradual global warming could lead to a relatively abrupt slowing of the ocean's thermal haline conveyor, that's the Gulf Stream, ladies and gentlemen, which could lead to harsher winter conditions, sharply reduced soil moisture, and more intense winds in certain regions that currently provide a significant fraction of the world's food production with inadequate preparation. The result could be a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. That means people are going to die. That's what that means. Has anybody seen the, the, the film, The Day After Tomorrow? Anybody? Okay, a few. There's some science in there and some science fiction. If you haven't seen it, I would urge you to get a copy from the library, uh, borrow a copy, whatever it takes. The opening scene is something, it, it, it's a dramatic uh, interpretation of what really did happen, which was Larsen Ice Shelf B breaking away from the Antarctic continent. That really did happen. Very dramatic event. Now, some of the science in there is what will be happening in the future with abrupt climate change. The science fiction in that film is what's going to cause it. And the science fiction is human activity creating CO2 greenhouse gases. That's the science fiction. There's three characters in that movie. They're oceanographers, and they're on a little island off the coast of Scotland, and quite frankly, they could be anywhere because you can do this from your home if you've got internet access. There's buoys out there in the Atlantic that give 24-hour, seven-day-a-week readings of the ocean temperature. And anybody can do this anyplace. You don't need to be on a little island off the coast of Scotland. So they're sitting there watching the temp ocean temperatures off the coast of Scotland. And then there's a dramatic drop in temperature 
on one buoy, then another buoy, and so forth. And what they're watching is the North Atlantic Thermal Hailing Conveyor, which is also called the Gulf Stream. From my private sources, I know that in real life, not in Hollywood films, but in real life, PhD oceanographers, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, are actually doing that on both sides of the Atlantic, and they're very, very concerned. Just a couple of years ago, there was an announcement that the Gulf Stream had slowed down by 30 percent. My private sources tell me it's been more than that. Now, here's the deal. You look at a map of the world, and you've got England, Ireland, and Scotland here, and you've got Moscow here. They're both the same distance from the North Pole. They're both the same distance from the North Pole. England, Ireland, Scotland, and Moscow. What's the difference? I mean, they rarely see any serious snow in England, Ireland, and Scotland. They, they don't have furnaces like we do because it doesn't get to be 10 degrees. And they certainly don't have the winters of Moscow, even though they're the same distance from the North Pole. The reason they don't is the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is that ocean of warm water that comes up from the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, up the east coast of the United States, goes over and down past England, Ireland, Scotland, past France, goes on south and makes a big circle. That's the Gulf Stream. That's what gives England, Ireland, and Scotland the very temperate, mild winters that they've always enjoyed. The best PhD oceanographers on the planet know that it's slowing down, and they know it's going to stop. There's some disagreement about when, and because there's some unknowns that they have to try to do some guesswork. But here's what makes the Gulf Stream work. It's the salt content. It's the salinity of the ocean. The salt content of the ocean allows that big engine to pump that water up, go over and come back down, and do that big circle of thousands of miles. The salt content is changing because of melting freshwater ice in Greenland and melting freshwater ice in the Antarctic. Now, the melting ice at the North Pole doesn't make any difference because that's floating salt water. So it doesn't make any difference. When it doesn't change the sea levels. It doesn't change this, the salinity of the ocean. This fresh water being introduced into the ocean is reducing the salinity of the ocean. That's slowing down the Gulf Stream, and at some point, it will stop. Three years, five years, 20 years, I can't tell you when. And the best PhD oceanographers on the planet can't tell you when. They can tell you it's about to happen, though. As I started tracking this matter of abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels, I incorporated into casual conversations with people I knew and came in contact with. I was having lunch one day with a friend of mine. This friend is a veteran of the U.S. Navy Submarine Corps. And I was talking about what would be causing this, because I did pretty quickly learn what would be causing the rising ocean levels and abrupt climate change. And my friend starts telling me what he heard in a classified U.S. Navy briefing. And he went on and on about how the Navy had told everybody in the submarine corps about rising ocean levels and what that would mean and why Navy retirees should consider moving to the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks because the Navy was telling, and is still telling these men, that the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks are one of the known safe havens when all these events take place. Later that night, I got home and I was thinking about our conversation, and something occurred to me that hadn't occurred to me while the two of us were together, and it occurred to me that, I was talk that we were talking about the same thing. I was talking about the cause, and he was talking about the effect. At that point, I also remembered a map, a map that a patient of my wife, my wife's a chiropractor, had brought in and showed my wife back in the mid-'80s of what North America would look like after the oceans rose to their new levels. Now, at the time, I thought, this lady needs a tinfoil hat real bad. That's the only thing I could think of. It was a beautiful full-color map done by a psychic. But I always remember the map. I have a, a very good memory about things that I choose to remember. And I thought about this map, and I, I called my friend on the phone, and I said, I got this map. I want to 
sent it a copy of it. I got a, a little copy I found on the internet, four by four inches. So I sent it to him by email. And my friend looks at it and he says, well, from the Rocky Mountains East, it's very accurate compared to what the Navy showed us, with one exception. Wisconsin's gone on the Navy's map. Wisconsin is still there on Scallion's map, Gordon Michael Scallion, well-known psychic. And from the Rocky Mountains West, it's not even close to what the Navy says, not even a little bit close. So I went ahead and ordered a copy of Scallion's map, a full-size version of it, and I get together with my friend, and, we, and he goes over the entire coast of the United States, east coast, Gulf Coast, around Florida, down to Texas, west coast, on up to Washington. And he shows me in great detail where the Navy said the new shoreline was going to be. He also told me that the East Coast would take damage up to the Blue Ridge Parkway. Now, the, the, the Blue Ridge Parkway run, runs north-south on the east side of the Appalachian Mountains, about 100 miles from the coast. Now, you have to keep in mind, this is not John Moore. This is U.S. Navy and classified briefings telling these men what would be happening in the future. Since talking to my friend, I've also interviewed three more Navy veterans. One was an officer in a submarine corps. Another was an intelligence officer from another service assigned to the submarine corps for a three-year tour of duty. And a third guy was a Navy veteran. Fourth guy, actually. A friend of mine, he's a college professor, and, and I was at his college class on international relations giving a presentation on terrorism. The other presenter was this former intelligence officer so we finish our presentation to college students on terrorism, and we go to a pizza place in Rolla. And there's four of us. Myself, I'm sitting here. The retired intelligence officer, his wife sitting next to me. And the intelligence officer himself sitting across from me, and my friend and college professor is right over here. Once I found out that he did a three-year tour of duty with the submarine corps, I knew I had to ask the question. I might never see this man again in my life. I've got to ask the question. Now, we haven't talked about rising ocean levels. And this, this, you have to keep in mind, this is a basic tool of investigative work, is interviewing witnesses at different times and different places, interviewing witnesses that don't know each other. You want to get to the heart of a matter, that's the way it's done. You find witnesses who don't know each other that have the same information, and you interview them at different times and different places. So I ask them, tell me what you know about rising ocean levels. His wife, sitting next to me, before he can even speak up, his wife sitting next to me says the following. We were on our last duty assignment, and we were at the Pentagon. Now, we've been all over the planet, typical military family, and we had to pick a place to retire. We chose the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks because of rising ocean levels. I had my answer. I had my answer. We talked about that a little bit more. A few weeks later, I made a lunch appointment with him, and I brought the map with me that I'd revised after going over with the first submarine veteran. I brought it with me. We met at Steak and Shake, had lunch, and I had him revise the map even further, getting a, a few more details in there. The third submarine veteran, retired submarine officer, he's one of my pistol students. We had lunch, and we talked, and, and he says, John, I signed these non-disclosure agreements. If I tell you what I know, I can lose my pension. I have to be out five years before I can tell what I know about rising ocean levels. I've only been out three years. I said, well, can you blink your eyes once for yes and twice for no? Then you won't be talking. He says, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> the retired submarine officer verified what the other two submarine veterans had told me earlier, word for word detail for detail. And he also, this is the third man who had chosen the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks for his retirement home. The Prophecy Club, a Christian group out of Topeka, Kansas, they sent me on a, on a nationwide speaking tour in 2005 on this topic. And up in, I'm up in Detroit speaking on this. On one of the breaks, I have a man walk up and introduce himself to me. He says, John, I'm in the insurance industry. And we've wondered for years, us in the insurance industry, 
Why is there such a cluster of retired Navy people in the zip codes of the Arkansas and Missouri Ozarks? Now I know. Now I got my answer. The Navy knows. Another pistol student of mine, a retired Navy guy, I said, uh, what's the altitude of your new home? He told me to the foot the altitude of his new home. How many people can do that? Almost nobody. He told me to the foot the altitude of his new home in the Arkansas, Missouri, Ozarks. Absolutely he did. How many planets are there in our solar system? Nine? Okay. NASA. Never a straight answer. NASA. <laughs> July 29th, 2005, announced the finding of the 10th planet, named Xena. Do a Google search. They did. Don't take my word for it. NASA announced the finding of the 10th planet, named Xena, 29th of July, 2005. Parade Magazine and the Sunday newspaper. It was a front cover of the January 15th, 2006 edition. A friend of mine, I started telling him about these matters in 2004. After the NASA press announcement in July of 2005, he calls me up and he says, John, you're not crazy. There really is a 10th planet. <laughs> NASA said so. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. There has to be a cause. And this is something, quite frankly, we don't need to address it, but we will address it. The cause is the 10th planet. Now, what NASA is calling the 10th planet is not the 10th planet we're concerned about. It's the 10th planet that's referred to in the Bible, also called Wormwood. The closer you are to the current equator, whatever that might be, the better off you are when these things happen, if there's a pole shift, because your climate's not going to change all that much. If you're in Miami, Florida, and we have a 20-degree pole shift, you're not going to end up with a really, really bad winter. You're going to have a mild winter. But if you're in Maine and you've got a 20 degree pole shift, you could end up with the weather of Siberia real easy. And when this 10th planet comes through our solar system every 3,600 years, it just causes severe problems on our planet. Interacting with the Earth electrically and with gravity both. The back of your paper, No Need for Panic, there is a number of books cited that you can get from the library or purchase from different authors that talk in great detail about these planetary matters. Professor James McCanning, who is a credentialed scientist, has written a number of books on this. He's a real astrophysical scientist and he, he knows about this stuff. I'm a private detective and a researcher. I'm not a scientist. But I can tell you what the scientists say because I've read their books. And I can tell you what Dr. Uh, Velikowski said, because I've read his books. And I can tell you what the Bible says, because I've read the Bible. And all these things are true, and all these things are in the process of happening right now. <clears throat> it took me a while to figure this out in the, for the following reason. All, all these Navy veterans, they were all told about abrupt climate change and rapidly, violently rising ocean levels. And I, I, I've been trying to, I was trying to figure out, and I finally figured out in the past 12 months, where is all this water going to come from? Because the men that I was interviewing, they were in the audience like you guys. They weren't the scientists. The Navy just told these men in these classified briefings what would be happening. They didn't tell them how or why. They didn't need to know. But they told them what would be happening. They told them that these oceans would, be, would become violent and have massive violent tidal waves that would wipe out all areas near the coast. Up until last year, I was thinking, oh, melting ice at Antarctica, melting ice at Greenland. But that, how could it melt that fast? Well, it can't melt that fast, even with what we're going through. It turns out the answer was right in front of me all the time. There's a quote from Velikowski that I'll be reading here in a moment when we get to it. It turns out that the knowledge 
is something all oceanographers know and a lot of people in, in geology departments in every university knows. There is a bulge of water at the equator. Now we need to talk, we're talking about sea level here. Sea level is measured at Cornwall, England. It's a couple hundred years ago, England was kind of running things when it came to oceans, and they got to pick where to measure sea level, and they measured it. It's at Corn they got a big rock, there's a line there. Psh, that's sea level. It turns out that sea level varies as much as 494 feet up and down from that rock in Cornwall, England. Now that's like a 50-story building. I mean, it's a lot of water. And there's a bulge of literally millions of cubic miles, cubic miles, one mile by one mile by one mile, cubic miles, millions of cubic miles of water bulge at the equator of this planet. It wasn't common knowledge for John Moore, I found out. It may, it's not common knowledge for most people. It's held in place by two things, the rotation of the Earth and gravity. Anything that changes our true north, our pole, by more than just a couple of degrees will cause that water to be disrupted. And there's a technical term for it, slosh. <laughs> and there's records locked up in bones and stone of this having happened in the past. Velikowski talked about it extensively in his books. Talk a little bit about this water damage. You have a map in your hand up. Now, from Washington, D.C. to Boston is basically one big city. Since World War II, that's what it's become, one big city. All that's going to be gone. Going down the coast to Atlanta and down to Florida. Florida, the highest point in Florida is on the panhandle, 55 feet above sea level. Florida's finished, except for a small part of the isthmus, maybe. And that's a big maybe. Gulf Coast. Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi are pretty much going to be gone. In fact, the new mouth of the Mississippi will be at the current Arkansas-Louisiana state line, a couple hundred miles up from where it is right now. Going down around the coast of Texas, Texas will take damage about 100 miles inland. California will take damage 25 to 100 miles inland, depending on a couple of things, the level of the altitude above sea level and seismic activity. On up the west coast to Oregon and Seattle, all coastal areas being damaged 50 to 100 miles inland. And once again, seismic activity is going to play a big role in what happens. Locally in the Midwest, we have something called the New, Ma New, Madrid, Seism New Madrid Seismic Zone. Once the Mississippi River becomes 50 to 100 miles wide, the U.S. Navy, not John Moore, the U.S. Navy says it will trigger th at least three nine-point-plus earthquakes on the New Madrid seismic zone. Southern Illinois will basically be a, a one large swamp. In fact, Southern Illinois is already pretty swampy. If you fly over the Mississippi River right now, you can see where the river used to be. You can see where its banks were at one time. A much, much larger river than it is now. I mentioned Wisconsin will be gone. The Great Lakes will become one vast inland sea joining up with Hudson Bay up in Canada. That's what the Navy says. And it's kind of ironic and kind of caught my attention when all, three, all of these Navy veterans, these submarine veterans, they all look at this map and they say, John, Wisconsin's gone. It's finished. There's, no, there's not going to be any more Wisconsin. Florida's gone. Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, finished, gone. EPA, our friends. Now, a lot of people make fun of the EPA and hate the EPA, but like most government agencies, most of the people that work there are good men and women with good intentions, including a lot of scientists. The EPA had a library, past tense, until 2007. The library contained the largest collection of cross-reference, important term, cross-referenced articles and manuscripts on man-made compounds and biological agents in the English language. In 2007, it was closed. The EPA library was closed, and it was 
a number of different locations around the country, closed to even EPA scientists could not access it. Anybody see Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth? Okay, one. Once again, I encourage people to watch this film, movie. There's some science in there, some science fiction. The science is about what will happen in the future, abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. The science fiction is what's causing it. It's not man-made greenhouse gases, like he says. That's a distraction. And that tactic was decided on many, many years ago, um, sometime in the late 70s, early 80s, that they would use that as the pretext to keep people thinking things are going to be okay. The science leaves out something, and the science fiction adds something. Al Gore gives a timeline for when these events are going to happen. Abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. The timeline that Al Gore gives in his movie is the same timeline that the federal government gives out through the, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute. Say that fast ten times. The NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute, which the Queen, Her Majesty, visited last spring when she was in this country, by the way, because she's got a sudden, taking a sudden interest in science. Jim Hansen is the director of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute, and the timeline he puts out and the timeline Al Gore puts out is the exact same timeline, and here it is. It's kind of clever what they did in the movie, the way they said it. But in 2016, things will start to get bad, abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels, Exact same timeline put out by the federal government through NASA. NASA's part of the military, by the way. If you notice these space flight shuttles go up, Captain this, Lieutenant that, Colonel, I mean, it's the military. It's always been the military. That's the official timeline put out by the federal government. Now, the real timeline. I found out through my confidential sources what the real timeline is. And I found out why they're doing what they're doing right now, moving the CIA from Langley, Virginia, to Denver right now. These relocations, which you could call evacuations, they're due to have everybody who's part of continuity of government planning. It's not all federal employees. If you work for Health and Human Services, you're toast. There's no place waiting for you in Denver. People in the intelligence agencies, people in certain parts of the military, not all the military. The scientists, the engineers, the doctors that they want to have in these shelters when everything breaks loose. That's who's being relocated, that's who's being sent to these shelters. These shelters are literally hundreds of millions of your tax dollars where people can live and work and have hot showers and pizzas and video movies for years without ever leaving the place and be quite comfortable. There's other things that could be happening in the next couple of years. Those of us who research these matters and, are, and share these concerns, we all know that there's multiple agendas proceeding forward and that what we sometimes refer to as a new world order which will be uh, basically corporations running everything, banks and corporations, they fully expect to come out on the other side of this intact. A fellow radio talk show host from my station, he lives down in northwest Arkansas, not far from Walmart headquarters. He says, John, I, I get plain brown envelopes with no return address sent to me from people that work inside there at up middle and upper management levels, giving blueprints of the shelters that Walmart's built for their people. They expect to come out on this. Another friend of mine was working with a Catholic uh, group here in St. Louis, and his job was to help set up military-grade radio communications between the Vatican group in St. Louis and the, Vat and the Catholic group in St. Louis, excuse me, and the Vatican. 
military grade two way communications. And we're not talking 10 4 good buddy CB stuff, the real military grade radio communications. The agendas of the people that control the world, the international bankers and the Fortune 500 and so forth, is to have a planet with far less people on it than there is now, either inadvertently through these earth changes or by design through World War III, a flu pandemic, or a severe economic collapse leading to societal disruption, or all three happening at the same time. These are all matters that could be happening in the not-too-distant future. I refer to what we're living in right now as, as phase one. Phase one is where normal commerce takes place. We can have our careers, interact with our families and, and our social events that we normally do, and life appears to be normal. The powers that be are using phase one to finish their final preparations. This shelter I talked about here at Walden Springs, Missouri, it took almost twice as long to build it as they anticipated. They kept running into the various problems that any construction project has, but they got it built. And they're using these remaining months to finish up whatever final preparations they need to get their people in place and get moved. Phase two will be when these earth changes events, abrupt climate change, bizarre weather, earthquakes, tidal waves, all become so numerous that they become daily news. In fact, when I meet people out in the street, uh, almost everybody comments on how bizarre the weather has become. And that's pretty much a topic of daily discussion. The government, the powers that be, will claim that these bizarre weather-related events are related to global warming. And when they're happening, that we need to start cutting back on our creation of CO2 greenhouse gases. Since I've been watching these matters the past nine years, uh, I watched it incrementally become a bigger and bigger media event, up to the point where Al Gore got the Academy Award for Best Documentary in 2007. Then it was like, we're, we're off to the races. We're up until that award, or that Academy Award, global warming-related news stories was maybe twice a week. That was about what I was seeing. Since then, since he got that Academy Award, it's been daily, seven days a week, global warming stories. And there will be no end to it. As long as there's news, as long as they're capable of broadcasting news, you will have global warming stories every day of the week from now on. As these events become more severe, you're going to hear more and more men with lab coats from NASA talking about global warming being caused by human activity and that it will be better and everything's going to be okay so you can go back to your baseball games and go back to work Monday morning. Things are going to be fine. That's phase two. Phase three will be a relatively short period of time. It may be a matter of a few days, maybe a week. It won't be long. At some point, people will realize that things are very strange and very dangerous, and they'll start doing things they normally wouldn't do. Say, for example, you're a professional, self-employed, or you have several people working for you. Half the people in this country work for small businesses. Many of the owners of those businesses are financially well off that they could lock the door and never go back. They love what they do and that's why they go to work every day. I've heard any number of people tell me, they say, John, the government doesn't want to create panic. That's why they're concealing this. No, the government's not concerned about panic. What the government's concerned about is business owners making very rational, very logical decisions that I'm locking the door and I'm out of here. No panic whatsoever. That's what they're fearful of, because that would shut down the economy if enough of them did it. They want to keep these people in the dark as long as possible. Most men, and it's mostly men because of the nature of the work they do, some women, who know about what we're talking about today just simply go about their lives and keep quiet about it. 
They're not public speakers. They take care of their family. They take care of themselves. And the rest of you are on your own. What I bring to the table is public knowledge of what's a very well-kept secret. Phase four will be the end of the world as we know it. Once these oceans come up, the infrastructure that supports normal human activity will be wiped out. Take, for example, shipping, ocean-going ships. The bulky, heavy products of the world, whether it's grain or petroleum products or coal or lumber, is all moved by ship. Ships that go in and out of seaports. When the seaports are underwater, all that stops. It's finished. It's over. That's just one small example of what we're looking at in the future. The housing where 100 million people live will be damaged and or destroyed. The potable water that these people rely on will no longer be potable. The food that they rely on to eat will no longer be available. It will not be a pretty picture. Martial law will be instituted probably before that, which brings to mind these other scenarios I mentioned. Economic collapse leading to social disruption, for example. If things get bad and there's uh, what appears to be a need for martial law related to riding in the streets over economic collapse, people don't have jobs, can't buy food, people will probably go along with martial law under those conditions because it would appear to be the right thing to do. It would look like a way to get things back to normal. So people will go along with martial law under those conditions. If, however, martial law is instituted because these oceans are coming, nobody's going to pay attention to that. They're going to get out of Dodge. They're going to get out of Dodge. They're going to be gone. And martial law or no martial law, they're going to be gone. If martial law is instituted and there's a lockdown before that, then we'll have a better chance of maintaining martial law. I've lived under martial law for a year in Vietnam. What are you looking at? You're looking at curfews. The curfew could be from 10 o'clock at night to 6 a.m. The curfew could be 24 hours a day. Restrictions of sales of uh, firearms, ammunition, and alcohol. Rationing of fuel, rationing of food, potable water rationing, possibly uh, rationing of electricity. We've seen that in Iraq a lot, depending on what's going on. Martial law is not a fun thing to be part of or live under, even if you're part of the occupying force because it changes your life. The Navy says, as far as ocean levels, the Navy says these oceans will come up over a period of about 30 days. Once these events get in motion, these water levels, these oceans, these tsunamis, tidal waves, will take place over a period of about one month. Altitude. The Navy says that everything 100 feet sea level and below will be completely destroyed. The Navy says everything at 400 feet and below is at risk of being damaged and or destroyed. But there's more to this. There's how close you are to densely populated areas. Now, the Appalachian Mountains, for example, in North Carolina and so forth, would be highly desirable places to be if it wasn't far being so close to literally tens of million people who are going to be hungry and without potable water and without electricity. That's what makes those areas undesirable, even though they will be safe in terms of geology and rising ocean levels. There was a question about money and keeping money and so forth. The American dollar is in severe crisis and is at at risk of no longer being the reserve currency of choice for the countries and the major banks of the world. Dollars, if you, can, if you call dollars money, uh, you would be well advised to maybe be looking at something else for money to store up value for future use, possibly gold coins, possibly silver coins, to store up a lot of value in a compact area, compact space. Before, however, I would 
get gold coins or silver coins. I think I would look at other aspects of preparedness, and that's why I want to focus on the final part of this presentation is preparedness. So let's look at the stepping stones of building blocks of preparedness. First of all, and most important, is spiritual preparedness. I'm not ashamed to admit that I am a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. I know from interviewing and, and studying what happened in World War II that our American POWs who were incarcerated in POW camps in World War II, our American POWs who had strong spiritual beliefs, were far more likely to survive what went on as POW camps than those who did not. Eating the same food, having the same medical attention, doing the same work, wearing the same clothes, living in the same buildings. Those who had a strong spiritual foundation were far more likely to survive those conditions. We know that for a fact. It's not my job to tell you what your spiritual beliefs should be. My job is to tell you you need to have strong spiritual beliefs, whatever that might be for you. Next comes skills. And there's a lot of skills I'm going to advocate. I'm going to look at my list here so I don't miss any of my list of skills. And I'm going to come back and read you what Dr. Velikowski wrote about what might happen. The skills of a farmer, a gardener. You will be growing your own food. The skills of a paramedic. Now we, we get so used to if somebody gets injured, we dial 911, and in a few minutes there's a wonderful shiny ambulance with these highly trained technicians that got all the stuff they need to save life. In a future where things no longer work like we're used to, you're going to be your own paramedic, or are you going to sit there and watch your loved one bleed to death from a chainsaw accident or whatever it might be? An EMT course is one semester at your local junior college maybe $100, $200, and you'll know more about emergency medical matters than 99% of the people in this country. One semester at your local junior college. You don't need to worry about passing a test unless you intend to be a paramedic or EMT. You don't need to worry about taking a test at all. You want to learn the skills, and you want to get a kit equal to your skill level. Now, the paramedic training is three more, three more semesters of college, on top of that first one. And then you'll have a skill level almost equal to a medical doctor when it comes to emergency medical treatment. The skills of a ham radio operator. Now, I've been in places, I've been in combat, and I know what it's like not to know what's going on. Being able to instantly and effectively communicate with your friends and loved ones we found this out during Hurricane Katrina. Two-way radio communication that you control could mean the difference between life and death. In Hurricane Katrina, it was a matter of life and death for many people. The ability to communicate with their loved ones, let them know they were okay, ask for help, or be able to give help. The skills of a backpacker, being able to carry everything you need on your back, your shelter, your clothing, your hygiene needs, being able to Clean yourself out in the field. Prepare food out in the field and do so in a manner that doesn't make you sick. Being able to take water out of a stream and filter it so you can drink it without getting sick. All the things that a backpacker knows, the skills of a soldier. In a severe crisis like Hurricane Katrina, for example, you're your own cop, you're your own soldier, or nobody's protected. That's what it comes down to. You become your own soldier, you become your own police officer, and you protect your loved ones because of these skills that you learn. Animal husbandry. In a severe long-term crisis, having goats and sheep and chickens and ducks and rabbits can mean the difference between a fairly good and healthy diet and one that's terribly lacking in protein. It's extremely difficult to get the protein you need from an all-vegetable diet. Extremely difficult. The skills of a carpenter, of an electrician, of a plumber. Things that we may call up a professional to do now, you, you will be on your own to make these repairs. The skills of an automobile mechanic. 
All these skills take years to learn, and you can't learn them out of a book, at least not and be very effective. There are some things you can learn out of a book, but without practical application, you're just guessing on how this stuff works. Where do you live? I've had a number of questions during our breaks about where safe areas are. The Arkansas, Missouri, Ozarks are one of the known safe havens. That's basically the bottom third of Missouri, not counting the boot heel, and the top third of Arkansas, not counting north, northeast Arkansas, that flat area where they grow rice. That's not considered part of the Ozarks. It has altitude. It's well above sea level, averaging 800 to 1,000 feet above sea level, some places a little lower, some places a little higher. A moderate winter, at least for the time being. I hope that continues. Good growing season as a consequence of that. Plenty of water, no shortage of water at all. And distance between where you will be and major metropolitan areas. The two largest metropolitan areas being Chicago, excuse me, being St. Louis and Kansas City. A friend of mine, one of the submarine veterans, lives in Mountain Home, Arkansas, very near the Missouri border. He says, John, we have all these people from Chicago moving down here. <laughs> all these Chicago cops. <laughs> Maybe they know something, huh? If you're choosing a place to live and thrive during a severe long-term crisis in the Ozarks, you may think, well, myself and my spouse, we can do this. Then I remind people who, th who are considering that of the number 168. 168 hours in a week, and in a severe long-term crisis, somebody's going to have to be awake 168 hours a week. Because no, t no people can do that, I suggest that at least six adults uh, come together and decide to shelter as a group. I also suggest that people have at least a two-year supply of food. Professor McCanny, in one of his books, his 60-page pamphlet about surviving Planet X, he mentions the need, the possible future need, to establish a new calendar. It goes something like this. If there would be a, a pole shift, it would change the seasons, it would change the calendar. In fact, within recorded history, the calendar has changed from 360 days to 365 days. That's, this has happened in the past. If it changes more than three or four weeks, though, Here's what could happen. You could plant your seeds at the wrong time. If you plant your seeds at the wrong time and you can't go to the grocery store to get food, this could be a life-threatening situation. So you need to be able to know when the time to plant is so you don't plant at the incorrect time and end up losing all those valuable seeds. Now I need to go back to Dr. Velikowski's quote here. Dr. Velikowski was a medical doctor and he wrote uh, several books about these matters, and he was hammered on mercilessly. One of the things Dr. Velikowski did was reconcile calendars, like when you reconcile your checkbook. And it's the nature of professionals in, in, all, in all professions not to talk to people who don't do what they do. And nobody had ever done this previously. And it's not easy to do, reconcile calendars from these ancient cultures. Dr. Velikowski made an observation. There is a passage in the Bible. The Israelis are having this battle, and they need a few extra hours to win this battle. And guess what? They got a few extra. Their day was a few hours longer. You know the quote, Jim. Quote, but I know. The incident. Right. Now, typically when we study the Bible, if there's something we can't understand, we just say, well, God's just trying to make a point. You know, this really didn't happen. That's what we do. Up until fairly recently, that's what we had to do with the incident with the Israelis fighting this battle. Well, God was trying to make a point, and he had the power to do this. It really didn't happen. Well, it turns out we now know scientifically how that could happen, and the only way it could happen. For the Israelis to get three or four hours more daylight, the only way that can happen is for the planet to roll over in space giving those extra four hours. Here's what Valakowski said. Well, 
If the sun didn't set over the Sinai Desert when it was supposed to, on that date, and he had the date because the Israelis had calendars and they wrote it down, that's a pretty important deal. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're Moses and something important happens, you tell the scribes, hey, write this down. This is important. So they had written records and they had a calendar. Velikowski said if that happened over the Sinai Desert, then the sun must not have come up in China the next morning when it was supposed to come up. And the Chinese had scribes, the Chinese had calendars, and guess what? The sun didn't come up the next morning when it was supposed to. Verifying scientifically the Bible and verifying scientifically what really happened. The Israelis did get that extra four hours of daylight, and the Chinese didn't have the sun. Of course, they the sun couldn't come up because the planet had rolled over in space. And that's why the Israelis, and God can make that happen. And he did make it happen. Now, Dr. Velikowski wrote a number of books. Now, what I'm going to quote here word for word is a quotation from his, one of those books. It's titled Earth in, Up, Earth in Upheaval by Emanuel Velikowski. Now, what he's doing here is giving a, this is one page of one book, one page of one book. He's giving a very compact, highly condensed observation of what happens in a pole shift. Observations based on what he found going around the planet and finding the evidence. It's titled, A Working Hypo Hypothesis. Let us assume as a working hypothesis that under the impact of a force or the influence of an agent, and the earth does not travel in an empty universe, the axis of the earth shifted or tilted. At that moment, an earthquake would make the globe shudder. Air and water would continue to move through inertia. Hurricanes would sweep the earth, and seas would rush over continents, carrying gravel and sand and marine animals, casting them on the land. Heat would be developed. Rocks would melt. Volcanoes would erupt. Lava would flow from fissures in the ruptured ground and covered vast areas. Mountains would spring up from the plains and would travel and climb on the shoulders of other mountains, causing faults and rifts. Lakes would be tilted and emptied. Rivers would change their beds. Large land areas with all their inhabitants would slip under the sea. Forests would burn. Hurricanes and wild seas would rust them from the ground on which they grew and pile them, branch and root, in huge heaps. The seas would turn into deserts, their waters rolling away. And if a change in the velocity of the Earth's rotation, slowing it down, should accompany the shifting of the axis, the water confined to the equatorial oceans by a centrifugal force would retreat to the poles, and high tides and hurricanes would rush from pole to pole, carrying reindeer and seals to the tropics and desert lines into the Arctic. Moving from the equator up and down the mountain ridges of the Hima Hima <laughs> Himalayas, and down the African jungles, and crumbled rocks torn from splintering mountains would be scattered over large distances. And herds of animals would be washed from the plains of Siberia. The shifting of the axis would also change the climate of every place, leaving corals in Newfoundland and elephants in Alaska, fig trees in northern Greenland, and luxuriant forests in Antarctica. In the event of a rapid shift of the axis, many species and genre of animals on land and in the sea would be destroyed, and civilizations, if any, would be reduced to ruins. It paints a pretty bleak picture, and hopefully that won't be what we're in for. Um, I can't stand here and prognosticate exactly what we're in for. I can tell you for a fact that the federal government has been spending hundreds of millions of your tax dollars getting ready for this since at least 1979, at least. That the Fortune 100 companies, or at least many of them, I don't know which ones, but many of them know about this. The major governments know about this and are making preparations. China and Russia both know about this and are, are taking what precautions they think are important and need to be done. There's a lot of people and a lot of entities that know about this. I don't know what else I can tell you. I've answered every question that I'm aware of. My passion is to help people be safe. I've seen the consequences of not being prepared. I've seen violent death 
firsthand. I've smelled the bombs. I've seen the bleeding bodies. I've heard the screams of the people dying in agony. And it's not a fun place to be. My passion is to see people be safe. And I'll do anything I can to help people be safe and be prepared. That's my passion. That's why I'm up here doing this. And with that, I will ask that God bless you all and that God bless this country. And thank you very much.